Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us today. My name is Frank Nagel, and I'm an assistant professor at Harvard Business School, where I study how companies use and contribute to open source and why competitors collaborate on these core technologies. Today, we'll be talking about how the motivations for individuals and companies to contribute to open source have changed over the last 20 years and how measuring open innovation has evolved ever since. Joining me for the discussion today are Josh Lerner and Knut Blind. Josh Lerner is the Jacob H. Schiff Professor of Investment Banking at Harvard Business School, where his research and teaching focus on venture capital and private equity organizations, as well as innovation policies. Most relevant to our discussion today, as Paula mentioned, he's written a great deal about open source, including the seminal article, Some Simple Economics of Open Source, which sets the stage for our discussion today, as well as writing the book, The Commingled Code, Open Source and Economic Development. Also joining us is Knut Blind, Professor and Chair of Innovation Economics at the Technical University of Berlin. He is also the coordinator of the Regulation and Innovation Business Unit at the Fraunhofer Institute for Systems and Innovation Research. His research considers the relationship between regulation and innovation with a special focus on standards. He's take, undertaken multiple studies of open source, including as the lead author on the recent European Commission Open Forum Europe report, the impact of open source software and hardware on technological independence, competitiveness, and innovation in the EU economy. Thank you both for joining us today. Hello. Josh, let's start with you. Uh, as most of our audience knows, open source software has existed since the 1960s, but started gaining steam in the late 1990s as computers and the internet were becoming more ubiquitous. And of course, today, open source is built into everything we use on a daily basis. As it gained in popularity and economic importance, academics and policymakers tried to make sense of this alternate method of production to try to understand why individuals and companies would voluntarily contribute their time and effort to building these open technologies. 20 years ago, in 2002, you, along with Jean Tirol, wrote what has become the most well-cited academic paper on open source to dig deeper into these motivations of both individuals and companies who contributed to open source. So Josh, what led you to write that paper at that particular point in open source's history, and what did you learn from it? Well, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here with both yourself and uh, Professor Blind and the very august custom cu group of people here. Um, what really motivated us was puzzle, which was that so much of the discussion on open source was constituted in the form of altruism, contributions to humanity and like, which, you know, by, by all means was there, but it seemed like there were an enormous number of good causes out in the world, right? From feeding the poor to addressing environmental issues and so forth. And it seemed that in some ways, writing code that ultimately ended up getting used by IBM or Red Hat or somebody else, you know, was a sort of funny notion of uh, philanthropy in some sense. And what we wanted to do is try to scratch a little bit deeper and say, you know, well, we're economists and we certainly look with one set of glasses at the world. Is there, you know, a way to understand some of the issues and motivations here from an economic perspective? Um, you know, I think when the, you know, this certainly stirred the pot at a time that I think, uh, Hal Varian wrote a short piece in the New York Times about it. I must have gotten um, 30,000 emails, mostly from outraged open source contributors saying, how dare you think that I've got an economic motivation for what I do? But the real effort was to try to say, you know, let's just try to look into this and sort of think about how these organizations work from an economic viewpoint. Great. Thank you. And so, so a decade after that, in uh, uh, the early 2010s, uh, you co-authored a book trying to bring a great deal of data to that. The first paper um, was more theoretical. And so the, the goal of the book was to bring uh, data to bear on the question of this economic impact of open source across the world. So I'm curious if you could just highlight the key results that you found that and also how things may have changed from that original paper the decade beforehand. Well, I mean, certainly one of the things that was really apparent by the uh, the end of the first decade of the 20th century was the what you might describe as the corporatization of open source, right? And not only did, did we see, you know, a handful of 
open source contributors going off to be ambassadors at various firms to open source communities. But you saw any number of organizations making very big commitments in this area. For instance, taking their own code and contributing it to the open source community, you know, having teams of developers as well as, you know, sort of various hybrid strategies where there's both commercial and proprietary uh, overlay. And, you know, it seemed in many senses the, the evolution of open source had outstripped much of a rhetoric around it, which was, you know, more the, you know, free as and beer kind of uh, 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 discussion. And the what we tried to do in that study is just try to show how much interconnectedness there was between the open source and the proprietary software worlds in a way that wasn't sort of saying good or bad, but just simply saying, it's just a fact that we just sort of see the extent of interconnectivity between the traditional software world and the open source one. Great. And and that was one of the, you know, that book was was a big effort to gather a lot of data. How did you find uh, the process of actually getting raw data on open source, you know, usage and, and various things? Was that difficult or at that time was it, uh, uh, you know, easier? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, we have, you know, this is an area that, you know, is sort of very reminiscent of the kind of issues that researchers today who are studying the blockchain are facing as well. You know, on the one hand, there's a huge amount of data in the, you know, in the tarballs, right, in the, uh, in the actual code base of this, of, these, of this activity, but really taking it and translating it into meaningful uh, measurements can be very challenging. So, for instance, you know, one of the earlier efforts we had done, you know, was actually trying to look at the strings of the, e you know, who is contributing to open source projects and email addresses. And of course, the challenge is that you do see people at IBM.com or Harvard.edu, but you see an awful lot of Gmails and other things where it's hard to pin those people down. So the notion here was to say, let's go and really approach both a number of uh, developers of open source as well as users of open source using more of a survey approach. You know, we knew that, you know, we always have to be cautious around surveys because of non-response bias and so forth. But I think one of the great things about open source is that people are the people involved in the community are very passionate about it, and as a result, there's been this sort of degree of willingness to take part in studies and sort of see it as part of the greater greater good. You know, you alluded to my other hat, studying venture capitalists. I think their ethos is much more: the less people know about us, the better, and just go away. But I think with the community here, there is sort of much more of a sense of saying that, you know, you know, it really is about community and this is an important aspect. And they sort of see research as potentially quite complementary there. Yeah, that's great. We found that uh, with some of our work in in recent times as well. That uh, thankfully there's a lot of folks willing to to talk about their their open source experience, which is which is good. And and actually, indeed, fast forwarding to today, another decade, uh, you and Jean Tirole are working on a new book focused on technology sharing, which includes a portion on open source. And so I'm just curious if we could get your perspective on how the motivations and incentives to contribute to open source have changed over the last 20 years, uh, as you've been you know studying this for a long time yeah i think it's, it's 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 very interesting in the sense that clearly we have seen you know changes in the landscape and you know the corporatization you know would be certainly one example along those lines the sort of changing mix in terms of the user base the interactions with standard standard setting bodies and so forth that i'm sure newt will allude to and so forth are clearly all important kinds of changes and evolution that's taken place at the same time, you know, some of the key issues around, you know, creating this sort of package of incentives, you know, much of what in the, the need for charismatic leadership and so forth are all, you know, remarkably constant. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating. I was just listening to a series of podcasts of some of the founders of various alternative currencies, altcoins, and, you know, they were sort of talking about the challenges of building a community, being a charismatic leader and so forth. And it was clear that many of the very many of the very similar dynamics that characterize open source have you know sort of carried over into that realm as well. So I think that in some ways, as a you know, I, I hesitate to use the word business model, but as a way of organizing activity, 
this has proved to be an extremely powerful model, which is now being emulated in other sectors as well. Great. That's that's I think something that makes a lot of sense, and we're seeing. Uh, we'll see where that all goes, and if uh, you know th that whole industry is as successful as open source. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Josh. Uh, Knut, I'd like to shift to you uh, and pick up with something that Josh mentioned and thinking about the, the difficulties or the ways that we can measure open source. Uh, so throughout your research, you've, you've worked to measure various aspects of, of innovation very broadly, including the roles of standards and intellectual property. And so I'd be curious to get your perspective on what makes measuring open source different than measuring these other types of innovative activities that you've looked at. Okay. Thanks, uh, Frank, um, for organizing this this panel, and also Orfi for setting up. Um, yeah, indeed, this is this is a challenge, and um, this challenge I think is 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 not not solved yet. Whereas we have for for patents really long traditions of yeah uh, government set up organizations institutions uh, where you have to go, you have to disclose your name, you have to disclose the name of the inventor. Um, and, and the original where we have really very precise data, uh, which allowed then uh, in the in the past decades really uh, really an, an uptake of, of research. And, and George was also kind of one of the, the the key contributor here of, of the the research, which is built on on this uh, very solid uh, databases at the national level in Europe. We have the European Patent Office, uh, which which uh, then also allows really uh, to do comparative uh, uh, analysis across the EU member states. That's that's uh, that's very nice, and and this was at the end also a driver for really uh, the developing of this really huge uh, community of researchers. Yeah? That's 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 one story. The other the other big database regarding uh, especially research output are. Uh, publication uh, databases and and here uh, the, the picture gets already a little more tricky uh, because we have different um, organizations and here private organizations that means we have uh, scopus uh, we have web of science as the two big ones which have really very good and curated data uh, which can be used and uh, now we have also google scholar as a much more open approach um, and at least here we we have a little bit uh, also the object or the the, the 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 opportunity to compare the, the different uh, insights. What do uh, uh, the different databases tell us about um, uh, this research output codified in in scientific publications? Um, yeah, as already mentioned, I, I I am doing work on standards since since twenty years. Here um, we face. Um, the, the problem there they are depending on the on on the country um, yeah, public private set up organizations poorly private uh, standards organizations um, um, and they have all different regimes um, also regarding making data available uh, some behave more like a black box others um, are much more open uh, where you have also uh, even the, the communication between different uh, players um, that's 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 very nice and there we, we see here also some some progress um, but but it's difficult to bring this together on a, on a global base yeah regarding um, open source we have github uh, currently as the most uh, prominent and and powerful uh, repository uh, we had some others before but uh, here we see um, a little bit of a challenge, right? It's, um, it's first, as already also mentioned, you have not to disclose all all your 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 details, where you come from, for for whom you are going to 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 work, or whether you are just there on on a private base. Uh, therefore, um, this is very different from regarding the quality compared to patent databases, uh, where you have to disclose all this information. Uh, that that's that's one one aspect therefore also our research is certainly uh, covering just what has been released and uh, we were following also your 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 example what you did for france uh, a few years ago um but uh, github has also a little bit the, the problem okay it has been uh, taken over by by microsoft uh, and um 
uh, and we see um, in the data a little bit uh, um, uh, an effect of that. And, and we have not really um, compared with other sources. There are some uh, um, organizations, but the, the, the quality of, of the data is still restricted. That means to, to validate and check the reliability um, is, is still a challenge. Um, um, there are complementary approaches. Uh, Josh already mentioned um, survey approaches, and uh, you do with Linux, uh, the Linux uh, Foundation's great work where you where you cover them. There are other approaches in, in Germany. The, the open source monitor was launched by Bitcom, the, the German association of the IT industry, um, which is a, a first step. Uh, it's, it's only national, which is uh, kind of a lim limitation. Um, the, 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 I, I'm just kind of uh, yeah, already mentioned one of the proposals we, we derive from our study is uh, in order to increase the, um, the data uh, landscape and, and the quality, uh, we, we propose to, to address the topic of open source also in the community innovation survey. Because this is a, this is a kind of a survey with, uh, which, which is now, I think, uh, since 92, 93 years, a very long tradition. Uh, and um, open source entered it um, as a, as a sub-question, okay, for is open source a knowledge kind of source for your innovation activity? And it's a very relevant one. But um, in order to uh, address then both the, the contribution uh, to uh, open source, but also the usage, um, I think we need uh, here a little bit more progress um, because data, data doesn't tell us about the, the usage. Uh, there are some private databases you used for your research, but this is not, not yet um, kind of uh, available. Maybe with the Bitcoin um, monitor, we make a step forward. But I, th I see the open source uh, question is, should be in the future really an element in the, in the community innovation survey. Uh, at least so I'm, it would, would make a, a big a big progress. So I'm I'm curious. So in in the the European Commission report I mentioned that you were the lead author on, uh, you, I think you've already covered some of the the ways you measured the inputs. Uh, but you found that uh, there was over a billion euro of investment from the uh, in open source from the EU in 2018, but that this led to a cost benefit ratio of one to four. So it was very impactful in terms of the outcomes. So can you tell us a little bit about how you measured some of the outputs uh, and the uh, on the the uh, uh, on the use usage side of open source? Yeah, um, as you said, the, the measuring the input uh, was was feasible, although we probably really under assess also the input significantly, maybe by a factor two, probably, uh, at least. Um, the, the output, what, what we did uh, and what what we, 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 uh, we, we, we did, uh, we, we borrowed a little bit of an approach uh, we have applied 20 years ago um, in assessing the economic impact of standards for, for Germany and using a kind of a, a, a macroeconomic production model. Um, what you did for on the company level, we, we kind of leveraged that a little bit on, on the EU level um, in order then uh, to, to kind of consider the investment in open source as, as similar to the investment in R&D. And look then what is then the, the, the elasticity it means the, the, the contribution of open source then to, to, to the GDP and, and, and growth uh, to, um, to the EU economy. And we have seen before the, the, the figures um, in, in, in um, the, the, the one um, slide um, before. Um, this is certainly not, not, not perfect, yeah? but, but it, it, uh, it, the, the results are quite robust. And um, uh, and they are also a little bit in line um, to the to the 2006 study uh, by by Merit uh, and and um, uh, and and here we we had another talk with uh, the the other uh, researchers from, from Merit and 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 it's in line with that uh, figures and it's also a little bit uh, at least from the dimensions in line with. Uh, um, another study we, we did on, on also the impact of standards. And if we say, okay, standards are more the, 
the, the, the, the hardware uh, kind of technical infrastructure, public infrastructure, and, and, and open source is more the, the software infrastructure. Uh, we get um, we get kind of reasonable results. There have been other uh, studies which uh, really come up with uh, figures which are 10 times or even more than, than ours, which uh, we, we little bit doubt whether, whether this is uh, serious. Therefore, it's, it was a very conservative approach. Um, uh, in order also to uh, to say, okay, that's probably the, the minimum. There might be more, but at least it's it's significant and and quite robust. Um, and I uh, there, there were some some activities going on in US. Unfortunately, I haven't seen yet the final outputs. Just to do a comparison, um, we also know that China is heavily investing in, in open source. Therefore. Uh, obviously, there, 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 there are kind of significant benefits to, to be expected also at the macro level. But I, I think we come to the policy questions uh, later. Yeah. Well, so let's let's actually go there now. So I know that the report had, uh, well, I think, a dozen uh, policy recommendations. You already highlighted one of them, which was the need for more data and the ability to, do, which would drive the ability to even do research on open source. I'm just curious if there were any uh, one or two others that you think are are need to be implemented, you know, immediately, right, to to really help with us, our understanding of open source and the ability to create and derive value from it. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Frank. I, I just want to highlight two or three aspects because it was already mentioned the role of OSPOS uh, at the at the beginning of, of the summit. Um, but very important is also uh, the investment in, in, into open source uh, in the in the context of R and D programs. And uh, um, we, we said also Horizon Europe as the as the big uh, research innovation program in in Europe. This is an opportunity and. Uh, I, I was scrolling through the through the comments in the chat and and some uh, uh, complained that this hasn't been not really taken up. Uh, that means it's still not not really considered, and and I think that that that's a problem. Um, and another another issue which which we highlighted is that more and more we see um, that open source is also entering standardization. Either the, the foundations are claiming to set standards by themselves or um, some organizations want to integrate that. But uh, this interface is very difficult. Um, and um, two days ago, the, the European Commission published the uh, European standardization strategy. They mentioned the, the term open source once, but but uh, this is really just opening the door. That means here we have to uh, to do much more um, in order to, to to get the benefits of both principles together, also in line with, with the difficult kind of tension to standards uh, to, uh, to patents. Uh, that that's an that's an issue. Um, and uh, what's also um, in the future certainly an issue is is the human resource uh, shortage. That means here, um, uh, this is, uh, for example, in Germany already the most named barrier to innovation in general. Yeah? And in the Bitcoin survey, um, this is also the most kind of uh, yeah, challenge or barrier to contribute to open source, that you have not the people to do that. Yeah? That means we have here certainly a bottleneck. And, and that's critical, although, um, and, and in, in, in a particular sense, we see a little bit also um, that the open source are getting into the, uh, yeah, the, the, the geopolitical battles and where, where, where Europe is certainly uh, not in, in, a, in, a, in a very good position regarding the, the human resource kind of perspective. And, uh, and if, if the contributions to open source like to standards and uh, the European standardization strategy really kind of put standardization now on this geopolitical level. And, and I, I could expect that the open source um, uh, dimension could be also becoming so kind of very critical from a geopolitical perspective. And therefore, if we need resources, we need also to, to, to keep our influence because then other, others kind of write the code and, and we have to implement that. And uh, there are security issues which have also been discussed in a panel before, uh, which, which are quite, quite critical. 
Yeah, and so speaking of those security issues, as as most of the audience probably knows, and, and we heard in earlier talks, um, the 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 recent log four J vulnerability uh, was certainly a, a huge deal. It affected millions of devices. And just a few weeks ago, uh, in in the U.S., the the White House National Security Council brought together uh, various members of the open source community, of comp uh, corporate corporations, and also of government uh, um, uh, uh, entities and, and bodies. Um, and so. I'm, I'm curious, you know, to both of you, thinking about, you know, how distributed and decentralized open source is, um, how do we see, you know, both the role of corporations and governments and regulators uh, to ensuring the future health of open source when we have this kind of distrib uh, distributed and decentralized uh, uh, ecosystem? Uh, Josh, maybe you can weigh in first. You know, Eric Raymond had that saying, you know, with uh, enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, right? So there was sort of a notion that, you know, the... The, the density of use of open source would end up, uh, you know, in some sense, addressing all sorts of flaws, whether uh, intentional or unintentional. But I think, you know, part of the challenge is just simply the, the massive size of the code base and the fact that, you know, when you actually look at individual projects, often the number of contributors is very small. So the ability for, you know, uh, you know a clever but uh, uh, you know, but malign individual to, you know, exploit that lack of information and oversight is still very much a real, a real issue. Knut, any, any thoughts? Yeah, indeed, this, this uh, security um, kind of challenge is, 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 uh, is, is probably getting, getting more relevant in, in, in the future because, uh, uh, when we all use kind of the same uh, uh, piece of, of open source code worldwide, then just the, the impact is, is very high, and therefore there, there might be also then, then more incentives to uh, kind of yeah, to, to misuse these these maybe also gatekeeper functions. Um, therefore, probably I, I think um, one has to think about some kind of uh, new governance mechanisms. Which, which address that uh, because um, the, in, in, in the standards world, the, their uh, mechanism, whether they work in all times, it's, it's a big question. Um, but, but I think here, uh, without any, any governance rules in the future, it, it, it might be really a, a problem, especially if, if open source might be misused uh, uh, in, in, in geopolitical kind of uh, uh, battles and and tensions and we we, we see currently uh, yeah between Russia and then China versus the Western world some some developments going on and 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 China is also heavily investing in open source therefore um, I think one has to find also a, a common understanding how to to govern this really yeah massive uh, pool which 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 has a Kind of a potential high potential benefit for for society, but also maybe for sustainability uh, and uh, addressing kind of global challenges, including uh, pandemic. But uh, we have also then to 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 assure that that this is really a reliable and and secure base. We we, we are we are we are kind of uh, stepping on and 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 sitting on and. Uh, because it's not, yeah, it's more less and less hardware. It's more and more software uh, where the critical infrastructure is based on. Josh, I saw you nodding there, and yeah. so maybe maybe you can uh, end us on a, on a high note and thinking about you know the possibilities of open source. You know, the theme of the right. summit is open source and grand challenges. Uh, do you have any fi kind of final thoughts on on how that open source may help us uh, with gr these grand challenges? Knut was just talking about. Well, I think that in a way, you know, the open source model is tremendously powerful. You know, I think that what Knut was sort of getting at is sort of the challenge of resourcing it, right? That in a way we have relied on, you know, either corporates who have had a relatively definitive, you know, specific agenda or, you know, as talked about occasionally nation states or else individual volunteers with, you know, various kinds of motivations there. And in a way, I think to really harness the power of open source, will take some you know, clever thinking about how to provide the resources and incentives to invest in some of these key pieces of infrastructure, which we all so depend on. So I think that in a way, maybe we've highlighted growing pains, 
But the only reason why these are so important is because open source has been so successful over the last few decades. So on, on that optimistic note, I think we'll, I'll uh, go ahead and thank Knut and Josh both for joining us and thank the OFE for having us. Uh, and we'll go ahead and say thank you all and enjoy the rest of the conference. Mm -hmm.